Today is an exciting day. We have five students who are going to talk about their presentations. They are each enrolled in Museum and Heritage Studies 533. Um, this is the order of the presentations, or the order of the speakers. And I just wanted to add a note that Museum and Heritage Studies is an undergraduate minor program that complements a whole variety of different majors. Indeed, today we're going to have presentations from students in various departments and faculties. The program offers courses on the history of museums, contemporary theory, as well as issues uh, and issues, as well as the practice of museum and heritage studies. MHST 533 or practicum is intended as a capstone course where students reflect on and implement their earlier class-based learning, build skills, awareness, and professional networks. For many students, and I hope today's students are no exception, uh, practicum is the highlight of their undergraduate degrees. Today, we have five students speaking about their projects, and we will, we might go slightly over time. I hope that you can all stay to the end of the session and uh, engage the students with some discussion and some questions. So I will stop sharing. Oh, sorry, one more note. This is important. Sorry, you can't see this, but I'll read it out to you. A very, very big thank you to all of the host supervisors and host institutions this term. And every term, we could not run this program without you. I specifically want to say thank you to TELUS Spark, to Canada Sports Hall of Fame, uh, to Calgary Stampede Museum and Archives, to Nickel Galleries, and the New Gallery. You've each hosted a student, and we're so grateful that you were able to do that. So I will stop sharing and invite Marsha. Perfect. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Marsha Gordon. Um, I am a history major and with a minor in Museum and Heritage Studies, of course. This is actually the final year of my undergraduate degree, and I could not have asked for a better last fall semester. I had a really wonderful time at my placement, and I'm really excited to share that experience with everyone today. As mentioned, my practicum placement was at the Calgary uh, Stampede Archives, and I worked with Dr. Christine Lefford, the Stampede's historical specialist, and Cassandra Cummings, the Stampede's collections manager. My role in this placement was to enhance the preservation of Calgary Stampede's postcard collection. The Calgary Stampede Archives contains approximately 9,000 postcards dating from 1912 to 1990. These postcards are some of the most highly requested items within the Stampede Archives, they will also be a vital part of the physical and digital exhibits at the SAM Center, which will be opening in 2023. This postcard collection was originally being stored in plastic sleeves and binders, which were not numerically ordered by accession number. Uh, there were two major issues with this. First, how they were being stored could lead to the further deterioration of these postcards. Not all plastic is acid-free, and when you are storing photos or paper and materials that are not acid-free, said material may introduce acid into the items stored within. These acids can then cause your photograph to discolor and become brittle over time. Secondly, because they were not numerically ordered by accession number, it was very difficult to find specific postcards. I was told it could take hours to days to find requested postcards because you would have to go through numerous finders like this one to identify the specific postcard. So not only was it time consuming to find these postcards, but it was also detrimental towards their preservation because many postcards would be unnecessarily handled and exposed to light, which could lead to ripping or bending caused from mishandling and light damage from UV, uh, UV exposure. And so properly storing this collection was not only vital in terms of more easily accessing the collection, but also towards the preservation of the postcards. So what exactly did I do to enhance the collection's preservation? This project was broken down into three phases. Uh, first, being resleeving the postcards. Second, numerically ordering the postcards. And third, digitizing the postcards. For phase one, I took the postcards out of those binders and stored them in acid-free archival envelopes. These envelopes would protect the postcards from the chemical deterioration I mentioned earlier, and they would protect them from light damage as well. Then on the upper right corner of each envelope, I would write the postcard's accession number, a keyword or two to describe the photo on the postcard, 
the year the photo was taken, and the photographer's name. This makes the postcard identifiable without having to physically pull it out of their envelope, thus preventing possible exposure to agents of deterioration. I was also tasked with setting aside duplicate postcards to be deaccessioned. Uh, there were a few factors to consider when choosing which postcard to be deaccessioned, including the photo's clarity, being the sharpness of the image, discoloration if the photo was faded or had stains, um, and its physical state being if there were tears or creasings. There were a few times I would keep duplicates and that had to do with if there was letter writing on the postcards. In these cases, the historical significance of the postcard would kind of override the quality of the photo. So I would sometimes keep the blank but better quality postcard and also the more damaged postcard for the letter on its back. Um, this was also the most time consuming phase of the project. And I should mention that completing this phase would not have been possible without the help of the Stampede Archives volunteers. Unfortunately, I never crossed paths with any of them because we were in the archives on different days. But every week I came in, there would be significantly less binders and more sleeved postcards in archival boxes waiting for me. And so I am very grateful for their work because I would probably still have been sleeving postcards this week without their help. With that being said, once the majority of the postcards were resleeved, I began phase two of the project, which was preparing the postcards for digitization. This involved numerically ordering all these sleeved postcards by their accession number and storing them in these 15 by 12 inch acid free archival boxes. We ended up filling 12 of these boxes, which I labeled box one to box 12, with the accession number of the first and last postcard in each box. And finally, phase three. These boxes were sent off to West Canadian Digital Imaging, where I believe approximately 6,000 postcards were digitized. These digitizations will be used for the Stampede's digital archive, which is currently being updated and is not available to the public. Once the digital archive is updated, these postcards will be accessible to the public. This means less of a demand for the physical image postcards, thus less of a risk of further deterioration of the collection's lifespan. The collection is now far more accessible and easier to navigate and will continue to be as the digital archive is completed. As well, the measures we sorry, the measures we took to improve their preservation will certainly prevent any further deterioration their previous state of storage may have caused. So we ended up completing this project earlier than originally projected. And so I was left with the month of November to plan and complete an additional project. Cassandra and Christine pushed me to come up with a plan which would better organize the archives for researchers and free up some space in the process. Some of the issues within the archives I was told to consider included the labeling of document boxes. Sometimes there would be multiple boxes of the same type of document, but their labeling would have differing terminology or the name would not best describe its contents. There was also some disorganization of items within their archival boxes. Sometimes I would find a document that was not properly stored from a preservation point of view. The document would be stored in a fashion that was causing it to bend, or it would be stored next to photocopies that had staples in them. Um, sometimes it was even filed in the wrong box. I also came across several unlabeled boxes that contained duplicates or just random documents put together. And finally, some boxes would have the accession number of the collection labeled on the box but not on the items within. So the labels would have the first two numbers of the accession number being the date and the collection number, but not the item number. With all of this in mind, I spent a day exploring and familiarizing myself with the collections within the archives. And with the guidance of Cassandra and Christine, we settled on consolidating five collections, souvenir programs, pocket guides, daily event planners, information and media guides, and daily programs. My reasoning for consolidating these was because they were all documents which, which centered around the general events and scheduling of the Calgary Stampede and Rodeo, which were distributed to guests. And so due to their similarities in content and because these collections are highly requested for research purposes, grouping these documents together would improve accessibility for those researching specific stampede years. It would also provide me the ability to improve some of these documents state of preservation while hopefully creating more space within the archives. 
Some additional details we established for this project were numerically ordering the documents by year. So I would be taking all the mentioned documents from their previous archival boxes and consolidate them into one or more archival folders, which I would label with the year. As well, most of these documents did not have their accession number written on them. And so I made sure to write the partial uh, accession numbers I mentioned earlier onto the physical document. We also set a limit of three documents for uh, three duplicates for each document. This allowed for the possibility of, say, one document to display, one to handle, and one to preserve. It would also give us the ability to deaccession duplicates, thus freeing up some more space in the archives. And finally, labeling boxes with the knowledge that there would be incoming documents every year because stampede occurs every year, but also because we may obtain documents for previous years, we need to ensure these folders can be shuffled around to accommodate these incoming documents without needing to make a new label every time this happens. So we decided on labeling the boxes, box one, box two, and so on without including the date ranges. The next step for this project was pulling out all of these boxes and consolidating them together based on year. You can see on the photo to the left, uh, this meant I would spread out over several tables and I think pictured is just one decade. Uh, I then would go in and write the accession number on any documents which did not already have one, and I set aside any duplicates to be deaccessioned. Just like for the postcard project, I kept the documents that were of better quality. Before I filed these documents, I made sure to reflect on how I could improve the state of preservation of these paper documents while being mindful of our resources. This was a great way of applying everything I had learned during my previous project in terms of preservation methods, while also using my own judgment in reasoning why we should or should not provide additional preventative conservation towards certain documents. Um, archival preservation materials like acid-free envelopes are very expensive and our archive had a limited supply, which would be necessary for future projects as well. Because of this, I of course could not use these materials on every single document, nor was it arguably necessary. So I used my judgment to the best of my abilities to validate the use of these materials every time they were used. For example, in the photo to the left, you can see the brown programs in the upper left corner. These pamphlets have been hole punched and seemingly torn from the binder they were kept in. It's also one of the older documents from this collection dating 1914. This also may be difficult to see, but the pages under the holes that have been punched are significantly whiter than the cover pages. So these documents are discolored due to age, light exposure, or contact with acids. They are physically torn from what I can only assume was scrapbooking. And due to their age, they're more brittle, more delicate, and at a higher risk of further deterioration. So these are the types of paper documents I would consider providing additional preservation methods. In this case, I would sleeve these documents into an acid-free envelope and label them the same that I did for the postcards. The picture to the right, I hope you can see, I label the accession number, a description of what kind of document it is, and the year of its publication. With all these steps completed, I could finally file these documents away. And the last thing I did was label the boxes from box one to box 23. You can see to the right hand photo, every box with a yellow or blue sticky note was a part of this project. So one of the most exciting parts of this practicum has been applying all the preservation methods I've only previously read about in my past courses. Everything from what I learned about agents of deterioration to how to properly handle different types of archives, or even whether or not I should wear gloves when handling certain archives all, are all areas of knowledge I was able to apply during this practicum. That being said, these projects did come with their own set of challenges. Generally, this had to do with the volume of archives I was working with. Um, especially during the second project, I found quite often I would think I was done filing a decade only to find another box somewhere of duplicate pamphlets or souvenirs I would have to sort through. But I have learned that that kind of comes with the territory in archives. There is always more work that can be done, more organizing, more cataloging. And so being able to see the beginning and end of not only one but two projects during this practicum has been very rewarding. And I'm leaving this position feeling like my work did benefit the preservation and organization of the Stampede's collections. 
I also appreciate I was provided the opportunities and trust to exercise my own judgment when it came to developing the second project and solving any challenges I experienced along the way. These projects have most definitely provided me with practical technical experience that I know will be valuable as I enter the professional field of archival preservation. I really enjoyed working with Christine and Cassandra. They were both very supportive throughout these projects, answering any questions I had regarding preservation or just museums in general. My time at the Stampede Archives has really validated my interest in pursuing archival preservation professionally. And I just wanna end by saying thank you to Dr. Hardy for finding me this practical placement that aligned so well with my interests. And of course, Christine and Cassandra for being such wonderful hosts these past few months. So yeah, thank you so much. That was wonderful. Thank you so much um, for that uh, really fascinating insight into what you were doing at, at Stampede. And thank you both to Cassandra and Christine um, for a stellar, a stellar practicum. Our next speaker is Catherine Ferguson, uh, who's standing by. Uh, Catherine is a third year archaeology student. There she is. And Catherine, if you're ready, you can go ahead. Okay, so I'm Catherine and I am an archaeology major um, and I am in the program for minors for museum and heritage studies. I was placed at the Telespark Science Center, which I found was perfect given my degree and my interests. My placement was a little bit different than some of the other students um, as I didn't have a specific project and instead opted with the team to work on many things to get a broader understanding of the programs that are offered at the Science Center. In no way is everything that I mentioned part of an exhaustive list of what I did, but instead a list of the main things as well as um, many of the main learning aspects. So I knew that the placement was gonna go well when one of the first things I got to do is sit in um, with Minecraft training and see how that can be used with child education and helping to broach hard topics with children, such as reconciliation. So I was lucky enough to be able to be part of the informal education that comes with the programming at the Science Center. Such education experiences came from school programs, virtual do-it-yourself Science Center, which gets students building science exhibits with the help from Spark, PD Day camps, and I even got to touch a bit on scheduling uh, needs for institutions as well. So for the most part, almost all of my time during the practicum was spent in person. Only about an hour or so was done virtually, which was done for the DIY Science Center. With this program, I was able to attend a brainstorming meeting with some students from a couple of schools in British Columbia. We were able to have some fun activities virtually to help them start the process of thinking on what they may want to do for their exhibits. With this, uh, students get exposure to museum designing, and this also allows them to put their knowledge of science into a project. This is one program that has had to pivot its delivery when everything had to be done virtually. And because of this, they've been able to also reach a much larger area than just Calgary and area. So one of the main activities that I was part of was school programming, and I was able to learn some of the curriculum needs that can be met with the, with the programming at the Science Center. So on this slide, we can see that there are different types of programming that are offered just at the Science Center for schools. So there's K to three and four to six on the side. So one of the main really neat things is that there has also been this pivot uh, for virtual programs. And there's even the start of a pilot program, which is spark to go where um, the, um, the employees at Spark can go to schools and help uh, with the programming there. So I was able to help out through this with a variety of grades, which really helped to understand how and around what age group certain skills tend to be present um, I also got to see how the instruction kind of changes between uh, different age groups, um, such things as with some of the younger grades, um, if we went into the labs, we got to do such things as um, teach some of the kids that may not have exposure to these programs or to labs, um, how to pour, how to properly pour from a beaker and um, 
also kind of see what different equipment is called and everything as well. So one example of one of the school programs that I was able to help run is something that uh, surrounds water filters. Um, we can see on the right and left, sorry, right and center photograph that um, this is kind of what the program covers and the curriculum connections, um, as well as in the left portion is um, a portion of one of the lab rooms that is used. So here are some of the exper experimental parts of the program uh, that we get to use with the students. So the students need to replicate and observe utilizing uh, science techniques. So in this case, uh, with the water filters programming, there was a link to the Alberta curriculum in such things as human activities, which may lead to uh, waste being produced, and how we may deal with the disposal of these items, as well as many other points. Um, it attaches with the waste and our world, as well as testing materials and design components, which are all parts of the Alberta curriculum. These school programs are an opportunity for fun activity outside of a classroom that greatly complements the curriculum that is set out by the, by the province. So another thing that I was lucky to be able to be a part of um, was many new programs, as well as coding that is um, being implemented at the Science Center. So I was able to work with um, Flint, the robo dog from Boston Dynamics, as well as uh, Birdly, which is kind of like a fun VR ride. Um, both are pictured on the slide. So one of the days that I was able to go into the Science Center, um, I was actually able to operate Flint for a bit, um, as well as kind of go over um, any issues that we may have or anything when um, bringing this to the public, such as safety and everything, and how to um, potentially work with crowds as well. So another fun thing that I really enjoyed was being able to help out with testing some of this uh, Sphero programming. I also got to learn if wands and coding go together. Um, and I was also able to help test out some good program uh, uh, with coding to uh, check for skill and age appropriate content for a great initiative that the Science Center is working with currently uh, for a program uh, that is under uh, an hour of code. So for someone who knew very little about coding, I actually feel like I have come out of this placement with a little bit of a novice title with uh, coding. So another aspect that I really got to work with was PD day camps, so uh, as well as other programming. So I think that this was invaluable as you get to kind of see what goes into the running of these camps and kind of seeing firsthand that days can be unpredictable despite how much it can be structured. Um, but at the end of the day, it can be enjoyed by all in attendance. So uh, these are days that I believe that everyone should be exposed to at least once, as a lot of planning and preparation goes into these. And at times, groups need to be flexible on the chance that a student is having difficulties with a task and may need to be redirected to a more suitable task as well. So one of the PD day camps that I was able to take part in had the theme of robotics. It was great to see how the use of both this camp and the exhibits and features of the Tell Spark, such as the new integration of Flint, um, were received by the children and that took part in these camps. It was great to experience some of these new activities that um, staff had also brought in, um, such things as uh, Lego coding kits and how these different activities could be used um, to teach kids not just about coding, but utilize all of these different um, activities. So these camps were great to gain experience as many institutions make use of camps and school programming to connect more with the community. Another part that I was able to join in with was uh, piloting some new programming for birthday parties as well. I mean, who doesn't like liquid nitrogen? With this, we flash froze some fruits to test out how they would smash. 
and that is the picture that you see on the slide. So one of the things that we got to discover was apples work really well when frozen and oranges shatter but don't really freeze that great. Um, we did test out how to safely make some ice cream with this liquid nitrogen and what can I say liquid nitrogen makes some good ice cream. So this testing was all part of a pilot to ensure safety and also to see how we could give a great customer experience. So we got to see how this type of programming could be offered to those that book birthday parties at the Science Center as well. So I was able to help pilot a few uh, programs and items, and this helped me to understand the process that institutions have to go through before exhibits and programs can be released for the public. I was able to utilize school curriculum assets um, in a lot of informal learning and how this can help to bring in return guests if the experience is there. Um, I learned that institutions can connect with the community through ex exhibits and events, but also through school programming and virtual events, which has been really important. Um, I also really discovered how much programming is a major part of any institution and it was great to see how the programming teams um, were able to adapt for the needs of their guests whether it was to accommodate um, anything from being from having to push back times for if buses would show up late or anything like that and how they have been able to do the shift through the pandemic and still be able to function despite all of the guidelines set upon them by the province. So um, I would like to say thank you to Dr. Hardy for all of her help with the placement and as well as all of her guidance throughout this degree. I would also like to thank the TELUS Spark Science Center and my supervisor, Alan, who taught me a lot about curriculums and informal learning. Um, I'd also like to thank the entire programming and educator team, such as Curtis, Caitlin, Kim, Lauren, and Nate. All of these people were amazing to work with and really helped me to understand the intricacies and behind the scenes of a science center. I'd also like to uh, thank Elaine for allowing me to join a bit of her Do It Yourself Science Center project. Thank you. That was wonderful, Catherine. Thank you so much. And thank you for joining us in a random hall somewhere with your mask on. Uh, that 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 can't be easy. And it sounds like you've learned some things about coding and museums and new uses for nitroglycerin. So fascinating. Thank you for that. Next up is Vanessa Lamb. Vanessa is a fifth year art history student who has been doing her practicum at the New Gallery. And if there she is, there is. great. Start whenever you're ready. Thank you so much. Okay, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Vanessa. Um, I'm a, as Michelle said, I'm an art history student with the Museum and Heritage Studies minor. I got to do my practicum at the New Gallery, which was so fantastic. Um, so a little bit more about me and my practicum. I went into the practicum with the aims of learning more about artist-run centers, um, their history, how they operate, how they run. Um, and sort of by proxy uh, about the art community in Calgary and sort of how it works. Um, my personal interests um, obviously are museums, but I really specifically adore art galleries and contemporary art. Um, I love the way that art can provoke interesting and unconventional um, conversations and especially conversations that we might not be able to have so easily. Um, my specific favorite pieces of art are generally pretty political ones or socially charged ones, um, ones that might be difficult to look at but are really, really important. Um, and to go along with that, the new gallery's vision, um, well, how do I, wait, do I just, there it is, okay, sorry about that, um, is, is on the screen here. Um, and it has a lot to do with those social and political art practices. Um, and when I found that out um, in my research for doing practicums or, or at institutions I could do my practicum at, I said, that's the one. <laughs> and then uh, um, Dr. Hardy uh, connected me with uh, Sui Ying Strang, the director of the new gallery, 
we had did a little interview and decided it was the right placement. And I'm so, so happy that they did. Um, so on the screen here um, are two pictures of um, the two exhibitions that were um, on while I was at the new gallery for my practicum placement. Um, on the left here is I Am Because You Are by Cyrus Marcus Ware, who is an artist and activist, a Canadian one. Um, and their, their practice is really just wonderful. Um, this exhibition is still on, so you can still go see it until the 18th. Um, so I recommend that you do that, not that I'm biased at all. Um, and then on the right here, I only have this um, picture from when we were installing the exhibition, so it's not as pristine as um, how it actually looked, but it's from um, Pulling Back the Paper, um, which was an archival exhibition as well as a research lab. And um, it was a format of an exhibition that I hadn't really encountered before, even in um, my Museum and Heritage Studies courses. So it was really interesting to learn about it um, and go with that format and I really loved it. Um, having a research based, a research lab format um, kind of took away the um, sense of prestige or um, um, potential expertise that can come when researching something or, or disseminating knowledge. Um, not that the new gallery tends to do this, but I just mean like overarchingly. Um, so the curatorial text um, was welcome to edits. The exhibition curatorial text was welcome to any edits via Google Doc. Um, there, were, there was a table not pictured here that um, had notepads where edits or, or other information could be submitted um, for the new gallery to then put into their archives and, and have as just more knowledge to gain. Um, and I just really appreciated, appreciated that. Um, one quote, from the curatorial essay that um, Sue wrote was, our community's histories must not privilege a single author and instead make space for simultaneous truths and perspectives to be captured. Um, that's really just a lovely quote. I think it's wonderful. Um, and it captures the, the exhibition really well, I think. Um, so other than the exhibitions that were on, while I was there, what did I what did I do there? I did a lot of things, <laughs> um, much like Catherine. Um, I had a bit of a broader um, practicum, not many, like not one specific project. Um, this is pictures from when I was like installing and doing gallery work, um, which was very fun. At smaller institutions and and artist run galleries, when there are less staff, um, everybody has an opportunity to do a lot more things. Everybody has their hand kind of in everything. Um, so I was living the real artist run center experience and doing really as much as I could. Um, so to sort of highlight that, um, I kind of, I want to tell a story of my first day at the new gallery. Um, we were installing, pulling back the paper. I, I walk in, um, it's my first time meeting everybody. So, um, Steph and Christina are there, um, the other new gallery people. Um, we all watch a tutorial on how to install grommets, um, go over a little bit of a safety aspect, um, go over the game plan for the day, and then Christina and I are handed a drill and a hammer and we just hop to. What we were doing is, I'll just go to the previous slide, is for those signs that are all on the wall there on the right, um, we run, I was drilling holes in all of the signs and Christina was installing the grommets for all 30 of them so they can be hung on the wall. And it was just a lot of trust for the first day to have so much of a hand in um, installing this exhibition. Um, I really am thankful for that. And it was a wonderful experience. It was a lot of fun. Um, and then these pictures here are from um, the gallery prep that I did after that exhibition came down before the Cyrus Marcus Ware exhibition went up. Um, of just sanding the walls, um, washing them, and um, painting them again, um, which is physically taxing, but it's an important part of gallery work. Um, I also did other things um, that included just gallery attending, so waiting for patrons to come in and then and then talking to them about art, which is always so much fun, um, and then gallery upkeep, some administrative work, um, like dealing with um, filing of financial documents as well as shredding them. Um, 
and and digitization of the, their periodical collection, which I'll go through in a second. Um, and most importantly, throughout all of this, I talked to Sue a lot. Um, I was able to ask her any questions that I had, and she wanted to make sure that everything that I did was a learning opportunity. Um, nothing that I did was for nothing. <laughs> um, I wasn't just doing something because I was the one that was free to do it. Um, they all, all the things that I did had a uh, had a purpose. Um, even doing the financial documents um, and, and shredding them, uh, I was able to learn more about um, institutional funding, where the funds come from, uh, and how they how, how to go about um, that in the future, which was really, really handy. Um, and now onto the periodicals, and also related to financials. Um, in the periodicals, which are just um, publications, um, independent or from institutions um, that the New Gallery has a really large collection of, um, even ones that had this had, had a stamp from the old Nickel Galleries on them, they, they're really expansive. Um, these are two from um, Canadian Museum Association's New, Canadian Museums Association Museogram. Um, and they talk about lotto funds. Um, and how they go to the arts. And that was a big conversation that me and Sue had um, because I didn't really know anything about it. Um, like I did, but it, it's like the particulars that sometimes get a little lost and having that ground of the new gallery as like that sort of case study or that real world uh, was incredibly helpful and really beneficial. Um, and this one, this one image of the periodical on the bottom right there, uh, with the headline about um, funding being crucial to museum survival, um, just shows the, how the themes of these periodicals, while they are in the past, um, they are previous events, they really carry through to now. And I found that throughout many of the periodicals, um, they had really important themes that can definitely be applied to today. So I wanted to go over a few more of those. Um, these ones, you can, you can look through the different ones on here. Um, the flower ladies are just interesting to look at. Um, but the one thing that I wanted to highlight on this side is uh, the one image with the pink underlay under it. Um, this was a periodical that sort of stumped me for a little while, um, just in taking down the information for them and cataloging them. This one's really hard to read, um, as were some of the other ones. Um, some were very clear, like the museograms from the past slide. Um, super clear, really, really easy to all put down. But this one, me and Sue had to sort of decipher a little bit about what's happening. And it got me thinking about accessibility of knowledge. Um, as we sort of shift onto this um, online dissemination of knowledge, I noticed that sometimes websites are not the most accessible places, especially for knowledge and institutions, um, putting forth that knowledge. Um, not the New Gallery's website, but like other ones. I didn't put up a specific example because I didn't want to like do a call out to one, but um, it's, I think it's important. And what this highlighted to me was that um, institutions make the knowledge that they're putting forth accessible. And that was just a nice reminder that, um, Museums have that responsibility to do that and have to be able to balance design with like functionality and, and, and practicality. Um, and they have to organize that knowledge and disseminate those messages in the most approachable and accessible way possible. Um, and then the, the last slide, um, or second to last slide, I should say, of um, uh, my presentation is of these museograms that mentioned the Spirit Sings exhibition, um, which has come up not only in my museum and heritage studies and my art history classes, but in other ones, in like my comms classes and my option classes about pretty much what not to do um, as an exhibition or as community relations or representationally speaking. Um, and this social responsibility that falls onto museums obviously was important in previous years, like in 1988, when it should have been better done for the Olympics um, and in that exhibition, but it carries through to now. That's still a really, really important thing that 
museums take the care to represent accurately, honestly, truthfully, um, and still have a lot of that community engagement and, and um, build longstanding and good relationships um, with community members. Um, and that was one thing that Sue highlighted to me a lot was that community engagement and how important it is and the different aspects of it, making sure that the, the give and take in those relationships is, is even, um, that museums get information from the community, but they also give back and support that community. Um, and this is just the final slide that I'll end on. Um, just of uh, Chinatown. This is an image that I took on like one morning before my practicum. The sunshine was really nice and I was early. So I ran went around and took a couple of film photos. But this practicum I am so thankful for. Uh, Michelle said at the beginning of this, this is often the highlight of people's undergraduates and I can definitely see why. It was so wonderful. Um, and thank you so much. It really, it made, um, like my academic endeavors and interests like really come to life and highlight a lot of them. So thank you so much to, to Michelle, to Sue, to Steph, Christina, and all the other members of the new gallery. Thank you, Vanessa. That was, that was a wonderful peek into all the different things that you were doing. And indeed, project can be one sort of focus or it can be multi-pronged. And uh, of course, during COVID, we've all done whatever, whatever we could. To, um, to keep you engaged. Our next speaker is Monique Riel, who is a fourth year ancient and medieval history student who was doing her practicum um, on a number of different things at Nickel Galleries. So Monique, if you're ready, there it is. I am ready. All right, take it away. All right, thank you so much for your presentations before um, Marsha and Catherine and Vanessa. It sounds like you guys did some really amazing work and you had some really awesome placements. I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, my placement was at the Nickel Galleries this semester. So as you all know, the Nickel Galleries is situated in the TFDL at the University of Calgary. I was interested in a placement here because um, I'm interested in a future career in academia potentially. So I was interested in seeing how a cultural institution embedded within an educational institution functioned. Um, I did a blended practicum. I was both at home and at the institution and my role like Catherine and Vanessa's was also blended. I worked on a variety of small projects um, curatorial, collections management, and numismatics, and all of the projects had an emphasis on research. And my supervisors were all wonderful. Um, I worked with the chief curator, Christine Sawiak, the registrar, Lisa Tillotson, and the numismatic specialist, Marina Fisher. So concerning curatorial assistance, um, Michelle and Christine did an exhibition in 2020 about the incipient, incipient stages of the pandemic and how we collectively experienced it. Um, so I checked the headlines. They, Michelle had the brilliant idea of incorporating headlines that we were also used to seeing these sort of COVID headlines that were so omnipresent and putting them together with art and, and incorporating that into an exhibition. So we have help here. <laughs> Would, it was incorporated with um, mental health effects on students and um, us being handy with the drill and, and things of the like like that. So my job was to provide some retrospective thoughts, um, which was, it was actually welcome to go back and, and glimpse what life was like for us early in those stages. Um, it was interesting to look at how we all reacted and, and um, just to reflect on the beginnings of it. And at the end, I don't think my retrospective thoughts were needed because with this exhibition, exhibition simple was really better and the labels um, really spoke for themselves. Um, it was a fantastic opportunity to look at the, the curatorial process in the nickel though. Um, so for collections management, I did a small audit of the Inuit art in the collection. Um, this was mostly research-based. So I contributed to the decolonization of information in the database via the incorporation of language and cultural knowledge. So I did a lot of incorporation of Inuktitut words and descriptions of games and activities depicted in the art because most of the art was acquired during when the Olympics were hosted here in the 
80s, I think Vanessa just said. I thought it was in the 70s. I have no idea. Um, so yeah, a lot of the Inuit pieces are focused around games and activities um, thematically because of when they were um, obtained by the nickel. And a lot of these um, objects in the database, the data just had the artist name and the date, and it didn't really reflect what a lot of these obscure Inuit games and practices were like blanket toss. Um, so the information, um, yeah, it didn't reflect any of the cultural values that came with these games or the language. Um, so I did some research to try and update all of that information um, and, and decolonize it in a sense. So I got to use the, the TMS, the, the museum system software that Lisa works with on a daily basis. Um, so I feel a lot more confident going forward um, with data entry and behind the scenes administrative, bureaucratic and organizational processes of collections management. There's just so much Lisa has to do on a day-to-day -day basis um, and prioritize. Um, I asked her so many questions. She was so patient with me and answered all of them. Um, there's, it was just really an honor to get to pick her brain about all of the work that goes into museums um, that are that's behind the scenes. That's the unsexy work she called it. The stuff that isn't curatorial. Um, it's it's so integral um, to the running of museums, and I'm really um, happy that I got to get a an in depth glimpse at it. So this is just a screen grab. I took it from online, so I did some blacking out there, which is probably ill-advised to take something from online, but this is what the TMS system looks like. So here in the description and in the notes section, I would enter into the fields the information that I had researched and found on the objects, and voila, it would appear in the eMuseum, which is the online accessible database for the nickel. Um, I'm sure my fellow practicum students here are familiar with it. If they've taken a class with Michelle, they've probably um, navigated the eMuseum at some point. So um, these descriptions here are examples of what I did. So I provided um, various Inuktitut words and some cultural information on the practice or the game, which are often much more significant than what the information that we had before would say. So for instance, this piece here just said cat's cradle and it had the name of the artist, but what it didn't have was all of the Inuktitut names for it, um, most commonly Iraq. Um, and that string games were an art form and were a skilled form of vi visual storytelling. Um, so yeah, just a bunch of stuff, uh, a bunch of art pieces in, in the collection I updated with information such as this, which was really fantastic to learn about Inuit culture in, in this way. Um, I have such an appreciation for their, their fun loving spirit and the games that they would play now um, and to be able to contribute some information to people who, who look for it um, you know, on the database. So for numismatics, I assisted Marina with some stuff, which was fantastic because I'm an ancient medieval history major. I got to kind of work with some ancient medieval coins. Um, I wasn't actually physically in the gallery very much, but that's fine. Um, it was exciting to be able to assist her with, I've, I've attended several of her guest lectures. Um, so I know that uh, this aspect of the Nichols collection is probably the most integrated into academia um, from what I've seen anyways. So it was really amazing to be able to see some behind the scenes work. So I, I liaised between a couple of scholars who sent me their thematic interests. Um, and I looked through the e-museum and assembled preliminary lists for Marina of um, what they might be interested in um, and just to, yeah, get to see some of her process. And I helped her with um, some research on some enigmatic and mysterious indigenous objects in the collection. So here they are, There's this is just a few of them. There's actually quite a bit, um, but a lot of them were accessioned and it was my understanding that there's not much information at all with them. So they're just kind of there. Um, and they needed to be connected to the numismatics co collection um, economically. So I, I did some research on the pieces to try and find their economic significance and um, just assemble some infra information for Marina to go off of. So we've got wampum beads and a Northwest Coast copper shield, some Hudson's Bay trade beads, which is super cool, um, and a, stringed, uh, a string of trade beads with some other, um, with teeth and shells and other things. So um, as with everything indigenous, there's so much meaning infused in, in every cultural object. So these 
um, from a Euro perspective, they have economic purpose. For instance, instance wampum was a really important um, trade shell for, for you know, centuries, if not thousands of years before the Europeans came and copper shields are associated with potlatch, um, which is a really important cultural um, ceremony of the West Coast where redistribution takes place and um, yeah, copper is sacred and the trade beads are sort of self-explanatory. But um, so it was an honor to get to do some research and provide some economic and deeper cultural information on these objects. Um, so now they're not just sitting there with with no information amongst, amongst a bunch of coins. Hopefully I've contributed some information that is um, of use to Marina. So my conclusive findings um, uh, from my time at the Nickel is one of them is that museum work is about problem solving. Um, so concerning the curatorial work, it's about working with what you have is what I discerned from the Nickel. So the Nickel, as I'm sure everyone here knows, has a bit of a disjointed collection that's got the numismatics and the Asian textiles and contemporary art in Southern Alberta. So they're all amazing collections, but how do you make those work together in a way that tells a meaningful narrative? And through um, looking at the Inside Out exhibition in depth, um, I was able to see through the curatorial work of Michelle and Christine, how you work with a collection like that. Um, and this would be the same for museums everywhere, I imagine. It's about working what you have effectively and in a way that communicates something mean meaningful and relevant. Um, so yeah, that was, that was great to see. Um, and problem solving, especially in terms of collection management. Um, Lisa, in all of the numerous questions I asked her detailed, um, just how much pops up on a day to day basis, uh, how much you need to solve right away, you need to prioritize, you need to, whether it's, you know, bringing in new accessions and making space for them, or it's um, issues with the software or data. Um, there's always, always something that pops up that you need to problem solve. Um, and, and you need to do it efficiently and effectively to keep the place running. And in numismatics, I'm sure that there are a lot of problems that Marina encounters that I didn't get to see. Um, but something that popped up for me was, um, yeah, reconciling, not reconciling, but finding ways to use what you have, um, to use the coins and incorporate them meaningfully into um, subject matter and, and of very specific courses and very specific interests. And this is something that I know she does really well. Um, so it was a pleasure to be able to observe these women and, and how, um, how they work with the material in a way that is, is um, culturally uh, um, meaningful and, and effective and efficient on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, my personal conclusive findings in my, in my own research, um, since it, the position was so, em it emphasized research so much is that museums, um, as we students of MHSD know, museums were founded as research institutions. So I was functioning under the assumption that all of that research had moved to universities. But um, through my experience at the Nickel, I realized that that's not true, that museums are still very much research-based institutions. It's just about finding time for time-consuming research, especially at a place like the Nickel, where Michelle is so busy teaching and Christine is so busy putting on shows and Lisa's busy putting out fires everywhere and, <laughs> and obtaining new acquisitions and, and dealing with the bureaucratic end. Um, and, and Marina's also doing creating programming for, for academics. Um, there's, where's the time for the research? So that's where, you know, I imagine people like me, practicum students and volunteers come in. Um, it's so important, but it's about finding ways to fit in time for that research. Um, and since I did research on indigenous objects, specifically the necklaces and the Inuit artwork, um, so that's a focus on creating indigenous knowledge in these spaces. And, and in doing that, it's, it's a form of decolonization in museums. Um, decolonization in museums, as we all know, is incredibly important as a part of the TRC's calls to actions and reconciliation. We have to move forward um, in a good way with indigenous communities. Um, so while it is super important to decolonize, it comes with a bunch of own of its own issues that museums have to navigate. So for instance, research difficulties. When I was researching Inuit uh, um, art and the necklaces, um, there's a lot that can't be found. A lot of it has been so effectively 
buried under 200 years of colonialism. Um, and, and in Nuktatuk words, like when we talk about language, incorporating language, which is a really important aspect of decolonization, um, there are so many different dialects across these, these different and diverse cultures. So it's, you know, it's about selectively choosing what to include or how much to include um, and where to find it. A lot of it is, is quite difficult to find if you don't actually, or if you aren't actually embedded within one of these communities. Um, and something that I thought of through research for the necklaces is the intangible and fluid nature of, of indigenous culture in general. Um, in going forward in a good way and trying to decolonize the way we keep knowledge, um, aspects of, of indigenous cultural knowledge don't lend themselves well to um, typifying and classifying and euronormative ways of, of putting things in neat little boxes and packing them away. And that's it, that's how it's been labeled. Um, whereas in indigenous cultures, a lot of these objects um, and words and stories and practices that are depicted in the Inuit art or that um, are represented in the indigenous necklaces and beads um, are living and they're, and they're fluid and they're intangible um, by definition almost because that is how a lot of indigenous cultures are. So it's in, in doing data entry and information updating, you kind of realize that there's only so much that you can translate into that system. And it got me thinking about going forward as museum professionals, how are we gonna um, reconcile two very different ways of keeping information in such a way that um, is meaningful to decolonization and meaningful to these communities. Um, so yeah, being able to do that, it, 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 at the nickel would just dip my toe into decolonization of information in, in a small but meaningful way really got me thinking about um, how to do this going, how to navigate this work going forward. Um, and thank you. Thank you so much. I hope I wasn't way over the 10 minutes. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Michelle, for placing me there. Thank you, Lisa, for being patient with me and answering all my questions. And thank you, Marina, for being so encouraging and for, for letting me glimpse the numismatics collections and, and learn so much. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Monique. That was a wonderful overview of the various things that, that you were engaged with. And um, I appreciate your, your remarks and your insight. Indeed, you know, language and which box you use is a huge issue that, um, well, minds greater than mine are, are grappling with. Um, so maybe we'll get a question about that uh, if we have a few minutes at the end of this session. So our final speaker is Layla Haslinger, who's a third year geography student. And Layla's practicum was at the Canada Sports Hall of Fame. And uh, Layla, you're welcome to begin sharing if you're there. Here she comes. One second, just got all the tabs open. So Layla, are we on a jumbotron somewhere? Um, I'm getting there. I, I have it set up. I just. Okay, to... I'll turn it over to you. Um, there. Now you should see just my slides, right? I'm assuming I'll see what's going on because no one says you have it. Um, so hi, my name is Layla Haslinger. I'm actually in my fourth and final year of my Bachelor of Arts in Geography, minoring in Museum and Heritage Studies and my practicum took place at Canada's Sports Hall of Fame. So just to give you guys all a little bit of understanding about Canada Sports Hall of Fame, they are a national charitable organization that has been around since 1955, um, but their facility in Calgary has only been open for 10 years and is currently closed to the public due to COVID. They still remain fairly active with the community by running virtual events like the annual Order of Sports Awards, and through online programs, including artifact talks, which are led by their education staff. Um, currently, their collection is being moved to the Canadian Museum of History in Quebec, or CMH, as you'll probably hear me call it throughout the rest of my presentation. Um, and this change will make the collection a lot more accessible, but really affected the type of work I was doing throughout the semester. And like apparently most of the other students in the program this semester, I didn't have a specific project or focus for my practicum. So throughout the semester, I worked with Katie Fisher and Kaden Redding, who are the collections and curatorial staff on a variety of projects, some of which were labeling 900 photos, 
helping pack 2,800 books and researching large accession archival methods, all of which taught me like, so much about museum work and a little bit about my own interest in it. Um, the most of those important, most important of those facts being though, that you need to enjoy and excel at crafts in this field. Um, it's not just a desk job that I need to take the words detail oriented off of my resume and that academics teach best practices. Um, so just to get going. So one of the things I learned is that you really need to enjoy and excel at crafts. One of the first projects I was doing was actually labeling a donation uh, that included medals, trophies, photos, books, clothing, and sports equipment. Uh, I think this is the first project I really took ownership of, and it was the first thing I was allowed to do independently. I shouldn't have been surprised that this is a task that I took to quite quickly, as a large chunk of my childhood did involve me doing crafts on my living room floor. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, for those of you that don't know, different mediums require different labeling methods, which include sewing, gluing, using stickers, or just finding ways to attach paper tags to the objects. Um, and doing this and like learning how to label um, made me understand how to use different mediums better and like the what acid-free means and all that stuff, but also helped me become a lot more comfortable with just day-to-day -day artifact handling, which helped with pretty much everything else I did in my practicum. I think it's important to note that it is not just a desk job and the stuff I was doing falls into that category at least most of the time. Um, and therefore I think we need to change our perception of who works in museums a little bit. Museum staff in modern media is often depicted as like these little weak women, but there are days when the job is really physically demanding. On my very first day, we relocated a large number of artifacts and even with wheeled carts and elevators, you still need to be able to lift up the artifacts and they're often awkwardly shaped and heavy, especially at the sports hall when you're moving skis, trophies and other sports equipment. Throughout the term, I also helped pack up the library for its move to CMH. And on those days, my desk often resembled this lovely stack of boxes. <laughs> and we were constantly moving these boxes, which weighed up to around 45 pounds. This really wasn't a big, that big of a struggle for me. However, at a certain level, like you need to be physically fit to do a lot of just the day-to-day -day work at the sports hall. Um, another thing I learned is by helping with just like the basic curatorial staff is that I need to take the words detail oriented off of my resume. And there's a few reasons for them and I'll get to that in a second. But I do think it's worth considering that detail oriented in most fields doesn't come close to the level of detail and attention to details required for curatorial and collections work. Um, and there are like many things day to day that really reinforced this belief for me. Uh, starting with uh, from getting to write down an object's accession number before wrapping it up. So then I had to unwrap it, write down the number, rewrap it, or I'd sit down to label artifacts and remember that I left my white gloves downstairs and have to run and grab them. And what I was labeling, I had to constantly remind myself to double and triple check that the number I put on the artifact matched the number on the accession list. As far as I'm aware, this is not a mistake I made, but I was very scared that it was something I would do. However, one of the most notable examples for me of struggling with details came up while labeling the State Canada collection. So one of the major projects I was tasked with was labeling and describing a large number of images that were gifted by State Canada to the sports hall. Just to clarify those boxes, they're full of photos. Um, and due to the quantity of images, I'd be very specific with the descriptions I gave each photo. Um, so I'm just gonna ask you to consider for a second how you would differentiate these images from one another as they were likely taken seconds apart. The most obvious way was probably based on their stance or based on what's going on in the background but it's still difficult to write a description that differentiates them. And it does get worse. These three images are all different and it really forces you to look at the most minute details. Because of these similarities and having to look at every small detail, I really struggled with writing effective descriptions for the images. And thankfully, we ended up reevaluating if this was the best way to accession these images. For reference, it took me about a month working a few hours a week to label and write descriptions for half a box of photos. And that was 900 images. Um, I'll continue to talk about Skate Canada a little bit um, as I move into my last point, which is in school, they can only teach us best practices. And that's mainly due to time. But the Skate Canada photos to me is a perfect example of that. The curatorial staff at the sports hall believed that there were maybe a few hundred photos between the four boxes. And therefore, the regular method of accessioning would be sufficient. 
However, after I declared that I had labeled about 900 photos, added them to the accession report, it was pretty clear that the usual way of accessioning and labeling wasn't gonna cut it for this project. Katie and Caden were super honest that archival work is not their background. So they asked me to do a bit of research on how other institutions have handled large accessions and how they've organized them. I ended up looking at the Alberta Museum Association site, the Calgary Archives, and a Library and Archive Resources Canada. And there was little to no information that was helpful for this type of project. Um, so thankfully, Karen Buckley at the UFC Archives came through and acted as an archival resource. She provided me with great examples of how museums are, how images are accessioned in archives versus in museums. Um, I also learned that creating a skate kind of fond was the best way to deal with a succession, which is totally out of my range of knowledge previously, and was something that helped me in another class this semester, which is always a nice little perk. Um, this was a problem that stumped a lot of people and is an example of how there's no way our professors can teach us everything about every crazy situation for every institution in our classes. Thankfully, organizations such as the AMA exist to try and create a standard for museums to follow um, in effort to shrink the scap a little bit. But even then, there isn't a rule for everything. Um, I believe our professors try and teach us basics and best practices with the hope that as we pursue our careers, we will be able to use what they taught us as stepping stones. But we do need to continue to acquire this knowledge and experience on our own. And I think the rest of the practicum students would agree that this program is a great way of doing that. Finally, uh, this practicum actually marks the end of my minor and some of the most interesting and engaging courses I've taken in my whole degree. However, if I'm being honest, at the beginning of the semester, if you were to ask me if I planned on working in a museum once I graduate, the answer would have been no. However, this semester has changed my mind. I'm not saying that I will end up working in a museum or a heritage institution, but I'm far more open to it as a possibility. And I blame that on Canada's Sports Hall of Fame. Um, as Dr. Hardy so eloquently put it in my last conversation with her, sometimes people end up in museums because they want to work with like-minded, passionate individuals. Um, and that perfectly sums up my semester and that I've learned museums have to offer. So just really quick before I wrap up, I'd like to thank a few people, specifically Katie and Kaden, for taking time out of their days to teach me and answer all my crazy questions throughout the semester, as well as Jana Smith, the Vice President and COO at Canada Sports Hall of Fame for agreeing to take me on as a first practicum student, as well as anyone else at Canada Sports Hall of Fame I interacted with. And of course, Dr. Hardy for her continued support throughout the term. Um, thank you all for your attention and I hope you learned a little something about museum and heritage institutions. That was wonderful, Layla. Thank you so much. And um, I know I know you kind of flip flopped back and forth, but I'm glad that you know we opened your mind. You were all great, and I want to say again, thank you to all of the hosts, um, the individuals, and the institutions. Thank you to all of you for you know weathering uncertainty and COVID restrictions and uh, um, sometimes, you know, someone in charge that took too long to respond to your emails. I'm sorry. <laughs> but uh, you're all, you know, superstars and have really bright futures. Who knows what you're going to do. But uh, I'm so glad that you've had this experience um, learning about museums from the inside out. And uh, just lots more kudos coming in.